he's got the same Christopher Walken hair. He's got the same Christopher Walken face. And he's like, this Paul Atreides uh, send the assassins to kill him. I'm, I'm like, Christopher, act. Just act. <laughs> Nerd Legion is back this week with Dune, part two. Uh, obviously, we do a lot of sci-fi and fantasy on this show. That's its primary purpose. Although, I will say, guys, because you have requested it so many times, we will be taking a slight detour into the new Shogun series uh, for next okay. week. Not It's, okay. it's historical drama. It doesn't it's, really It's count. close enough. I feel like it's not a giant bridge to cross to get from sci-fi fantasy to period drama, um, especially if there's samurai involved. So I, I think it's I think it's okay. I don't think this is something we're going to be doing very often, but I, I, I don't have a problem with this. Yeah, I, I mean, I want to watch the show, and I've heard it's very good, and I will be watching the show yeah. regardless, so it did seem like something that you guys wanted, so we will be doing that uh, for next week, just so you're aware. And also, we are talking about Dune 2 here, but on our other show on this channel, we are going to be doing uh, Denis Villeneuve movies on foreplay for the next month. Um, starting with Arrival. So if you guys liked Great Dune movie. 2 and you like this conversation and you want to follow along with some of uh, Villeneuve's previous work to Dune 2, then you'll want to watch Foreplay also. So we have the synergy going between the shows now, Della. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not the tonal synergy, but we do have the, the movie <laughs> synergy going at least. That, that is true. Yeah. Uh, so Dune 2, Della, just came out. I am a pretty big fan of the books of Dune. Um, so the first movie, I will say, was not necessarily my favorite because of the way that it presented the books. And I still wish that these two movies were like a 10 episode miniseries instead of two movies, because I think it would have given a lot more time to flesh out certain aspects of the plot. Sure. But I will say that Dune 2 was very good, and I thought it was a, a much better movie than Dune Part 1. Yeah, I mean, my feelings about Dune Part 1 was I I just liked it as a film. I thought it was very, very good. I, I've i read the book once. I read Dune once, and I remember liking it. Um, and I read, like, part of Dune Messiah, but I never finished it, which is, which is kind of incredible because the book is, like, this thick. It's really tiny. Um, but uh, so I didn't have the same qualms because I'm not so attached to the books. Uh, but I also like Dune 2 a lot. Uh, there's changes that they made from the book that we'll get into that I actually really was glad they made because mm -hmm. um, it was always super weird in the book. Um, and in the 1984 film, if you've been uh, you know, <laughs> blessed to have seen that. Um, it's but, actually uh, better than people say it is, to be fair. It, it is, and it's weird enough to be worth a watch too. It's just, it's also, just so wonderfully bizarre that it's it's fun. It's a fun time. If you if you liked uh, if you liked this interpretation of Fade Rotha, uh, you can enjoy singer Sting as Fade Rotha <laughs> in the David Lynch version, which is a very weird casting yeah. decision. <laughs> if you want to see Sting in a tiny leather bikini uh, in a knife fight, that's uh, you know, with some people, you know, I'm sure that's their dream. Well, that's my fetish, though. The, that's my fetish. The, the, the Dune 1984 is a movie for you. You know, I had, I had a before we get into this movie, I had a children's pop up book of Dune when I was a kid. They they made a pop up book of the 1984 <laughs> Dune movie. I'm not even I'm not exaggerating, and it, it, I believe it even came with like a record that told the story of Dune. You can look this up. It it actually existed. I remember this popped up on the internet like uh, a year ago, and I was people were talking about it. They're like, "Did you know there was a Dune pop up book?" And I was like, "I have that book," <laughs> because my dad has always been a big science fiction fantasy fan and all that. So. These are just the things that ended up in our house <laughs> growing up, doing pop-up books. But it was—I remember, I remember being really intrigued by it. Actually, that the the costuming in it uh, was all like it really affected me. In that, I was like, "Wow, that is just so different and bizarre and alien." I really loved it, and uh, it was you know I it was partially, of course, uh, influenced in a big way by the works of H.R. Geiger, uh, who worked on the Dune movie that didn't end up happening. 
Uh, but then they kind of use some of those ideas for the costuming yep. in that movie, as far as I understand it. Uh, and I that, I think, kind of put me on my path to really loving H.R. Geiger's artwork and how, like, weirdly biomechanical it all is. I, I was always, like, fascinated with all that. So, funny enough, that pop-up book had, like, a big influence on my my artistic preferences uh, going forward, too. <laughs> so, weird footnote there, but uh, the Dune pop-up book, big, big in my childhood. <laughs> and, and if you guys, if you have been enjoying Dune, uh, one thing that I will put out there for you is if you haven't seen the documentary, uh, Yodorovsky's Dune, which Doa is referencing here. So, uh, Alejandro Yodorovsky was a prolific uh, graphic novel author of graphic novels like The Encall and Meta Barons, Techno Priests, a um, bunch of these very, very good, like, and I would recommend all of these graphic novels to you, um, especially he was very active in the 1970s. He was also a filmmaker, so he made a very strange he made very strange art films probably the most uh, famous of which is a film called holy mountain which again would recommend to you guys but he had a very ambitious plan for creating like an eight hour long dune huge dune film in in the 70s and 80s um and there's a documentary about how this film didn't get made um, but they had it kind of all storyboarded out. And to Doa's point, they had H.R. Geiger, who became very famous for doing the designs for uh, Alien uh, in Ridley Scott's movie that kicked off the Alien franchise. And a lot of those designs were taken from H.R. Geiger's designs for House Harkonnen architecture um, in Yodorovsky's proposed, proposed Dune movie. And the more you learn about this Dune movie, like the crazier it is. So... Uh, Yodorovsky actually was training his son like a warrior monk for years to prepare him for the role of Paul Atreides, like yeah. sending him to martial arts and doing like, um, you know, Zen mental training. Um, Salvador Dali was supposed to be the Padishah emperor. So there that would have this, been a terrible idea. But would it have been is, as terrible as the emperor we did get in this movie? I don't know. That's a that's a conversation <laughs> we'll have to have later. So there was a lot. It, this 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 documentary is wild. And if you have enjoyed um, Villeneuve's version of Dune, you would very much, I think, enjoy checking out Yodorovsky's Dune documentary. Um, so that's- a, I haven't a, a, seen that, actually. I haven't seen you that You haven't? I, oh, I have, my I've always God. Because I've, <laughs> I've read about this movie a ton. I mean, I, I've done, you know, I've, I've read tons of articles and things about this. So I'm, I'm familiar with all the, the weirdness that existed around that. But, but no, I've never actually seen the documentary. It's I, great. I really- I really intend to someday. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Uh, would recommend you guys watching it um, and just engaging in Yodorovsky's work in general uh, if you enjoyed Dune. Yeah. Um, so anyway, and and there is, I think, some pretty big Yodorovsky um, inspiration in this. Like, I I could not escape Doa thinking about mm. the art of Meta Barons when I was looking at the Harkonnen homeworld. Because oh, totally. yeah. even yeah. though this was not as H.R. Geigery, it was definitely very Meta Barons y when it comes to it was. Uh, the architecture and and the design of of House Harkonnen. It's like it's like brutalism taken to the extreme, you know? Yeah. Where it's like it's it's not just the architecture that's brutal; it's everything that's brutal. Um, <laughs> and and I I love those sequences and uh, it. And how they shot that. Uh, you you heard about that, the House Harkonnen stuff on, on Getty Prime was shot in infrared. Did you hear that? No, that's a fascinating. Yeah. Thing. All the, that's why you have the skin complexion that looks so like pallid and like wormy, sort of grubby. And that's why uh, in, when they're inside buildings, they're they're shot normally. But when they're out under the, the black sun, they shot all of that in infrared. Uh, that's why like when, um, you know, when Fade Rotha, you know, screams over his mouth, it's black on the inside. Because uh, mm. it's it's uh, taking the they filmed it in black and white infrared, so the hotter things were darker, right. and it just created this really really interesting uh, sheen to everything. And yeah, it's beautiful. Everything. Uh, I was thinking about that when I watched the movie. I was like, wow, this just looks really different, and I can't put my finger on why. And then I read that, and I was like, that's that is really neat. And what a what a what a bold choice to do because <laughs> I, I read about this a little bit more, and and 
Denny Villeneuve, uh, Villeneuve apparently was to the studio. He was like, okay, I want to do this, but if we shoot it like this, there's no going back. You can't take this and just like make it, you try to make it look normal. It is going to look it's like gonna it look looked, weird. And yeah. You have to be okay with the whatever we get. And they, they went for it. I'm really glad they did because it, was, it looks great. Very different. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It looks great. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think we should talk, you know, briefly about, uh, Dune part one, uh, sure. and then we can talk about Dune part two, because I just need to get, I, I need to kind of get Dune part one off my chest because it does work sure. better in the context of Dune part two. But for me, it also shows what was kind of unsuccessful about Dune part one, which is that they rush a lot of things along in terms of the story. Whereas Dune part two gives a lot more dialogue, a lot more time for the plot to kind of slowly and naturally develop. Whereas yeah. a lot of what pissed me off about Dune part one as a Dune fan uh, was the just like, oh, very rushed. Like, let's get them off Caladan. Let's get them, you know, onto Arrakis. Oh, no, they're already being attacked. And there really yeah. wasn't a lot of time to explain the relationships of the Atreides family with the the staff um, that are there. And I know you guys, if you've just seen the the Dune movie or you've read the first Dune book, you may not understand why Paul's relationship with Duncan Idaho is very important. But later on, without doing spoilers, it is very important. And so to rush mm -hmm. through the Paul Duncan Idaho arc feels really weird in the context of what could be coming uh, in future Dune movie or TV adaptations. Um, so I was not very thrilled with that. And then the other thing is that Obviously, as somebody who knows the Dune universe quite well, you can kind of gloss over some of the more important things that have to deal with the universe. And I just take them for granted, such as what are Mentats? Why is the yeah. spice important? And I do think that this mo these movies did a very shit job of explaining why the spice is important. They and did gloss a lot over <laughs> a lot of that, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is weird, because it's like the core element of the plot. It is the it is the core thing on which the plot rests. And I do know, I rewatched Dune 1 the night before I watched Dune 2. And so they do kind of have a very brief piece of dialogue where they explain this is important to the spacing guild because it allows them to facilitate faster than light travel um, but they don't really explain how it works and so it becomes kind of just this weird MacGuffin for the rest of the movies that isn't like both movies that isn't explained very thoroughly and like it doesn't yeah. bother me so much because I know the reasons already but purely if I'm viewing this from the lens of someone who doesn't understand this universe it can feel like they're kind of fighting over nothing um, um, so I, I tried to explain this stuff to, uh, to my wife who saw it with me and, and she, you know, really loved the visuals in it and all that, but it, it, it did not go well. I was like, okay, so, so there was this war with like the AIs, right? So yes. basically like the AIs, which they also don't, was, they, they don't they explain don't the, the they no. don't explain the so. Butlerian <laughs> Jihad is all, at all. And they don't explain yeah. why there are no computers at all. And all of yeah. these things are very important. They are the core of the Dune universe so, and they just so don't let me explain touch them. them. Let me explain, basically, in case you're unfamiliar with the Dune universe a little bit. So, so to, to very briefly, broadly go over why the spice the spice is important. Spores, spores, flow, <laughs> spice. But uh, it, this why it's important is because basically there was a war a long, long time ago. Uh, humans versus AI, basically. Computers got too smart. Terminator Matrix, whatever you want to, you know, put there. That happened. Uh, so then basically they destroyed all the computers and then there is basically just this understanding laws, all that we will never do. We will never make computers again. So then it's like, OK, well, how do we have a modern society without any sort of computing? And the answer was in the spice, which uh, improved the uh, cognitive and then latent psychic abilities of humanity that started to emerge to the level where they could basically do the calculation that they would have needed a yes. computer to do previously. So when it comes to light speed, they have people called navigators who basically are high on spice all the time. In fact, they're kind of like also spice. They're mutated. Yeah, they're well. mutated people in tanks in, like in the spaceships. Yeah, 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 exactly. So but their their mental abilities and psychic abilities have become so powerful that uh, they are able to calculate trajectories uh, for ships to move in light speed and stuff. And so the entire transportation network. of Well, they fold. Anyway, technically, they fold space and move instantaneously. But yes. 
Yeah, basically. Yeah, but yeah. The calculations involved in doing yes. that a need a mind that is enhanced by spice. That's why yes. Arrakis is so important because that yes. is the only place that you can get the spice. So right, and and there for other computational tasks, when I say mentat, uh, there are people who are basically human computers, and I I I have Journey seen Halleck, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. It's uh, Thufir Arawat, who is a character, oh, yeah, yeah. but like never. He's the guy with the the I tattoo agree. on his lip. Um, yeah, but yeah. he just like goes away and they completely kill his entire storyline in Dune, which is weird if you've read the books. And they basically I, I've seen Vill Villeneuve say that he didn't touch the Mentat storyline because it was just too much to put in the movies, which I can understand. I and agree with that. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Um, this, but it's another reason why I would rather have this be a longer miniseries rather than the two films that were released, because it, it does suck to have. I mean, Dune fans know it does suck to have no Mentat really mentioned. And the yeah. Thufir story is actually very interesting and he just vanishes. So it's it's yeah. strange. I mean. The way I under the way it seems to be, as I understand it from interviews and things like that, is that it's kind of amazing that Dune got made in the first place. That the it seems like from again, from what I've read, it seems like the studios were very hesitant about allowing this to happen, partially because of the weird history of Dune in film and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so in order to make Dune sort of work as a single movie, because remember when they released Dune One, they didn't even know if they would be able to make Dune Two yet. Uh, the making Dune 2 was, uh, was uh, you know, going to be enabled in theory by Dune 1 doing well. So Dune 1 had to be more of a self-contained story, which led to it kind of being, you know, okay, here's the initial Paul Atreides story, Harkon and Betrayal, uh, and then he gets out in the desert, you know. And so in order to do that and kind of make a, a movie out of it, you had to cut so much other stuff. And so I don't like that we lost so much of that as well. But for the purposes of making a movie that would do well enough to get the second movie made, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm okay with it in that sense. Um, but nowadays, I mean, you mentioned it would have worked better to, as a streaming series. Now with the level that television has gotten to, I think most things would work better as, as a streaming television <laughs> series. As much as I love going to theaters, and this is absolutely a movie you want to see in the theater for sure. Yes. Uh, Storytelling-wise... A longer format will just be better, right? Um, uh, yeah, and, and, although and, I will say, I will say real quick, I don't please stop showing the ads before movies and movie theaters about going to theaters. We're there already. You got us. <laughs> We're in the theater. We don't need to be told, hey, going to theaters is great, isn't it? We're already in the theater. I'm sorry, Charlize Theron. I don't want to sit and watch you being super excited about watching a movie. I would just rather watch the movie I have already paid and traveled physically to see. So we don't we don't need those commercials. Put those commercials on TV or on the internet, not to the, the people. You never see those commercials anywhere else. They're only in the movie theater right before the movies to the audience that needs them the least. That is terrible marketing. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's funny. I don't see those because I'm in Korea right now. So it's like advertising gasoline on the little screens at a gas station. <laughs> it's like, I'm here. I'm getting the gas. What more do you want from me? <laughs> um so, so yeah i basically in brief i think dune one like really hurried up the plot so that they could get to arrakis have the harkonnen slash emperor betrayal happen as quickly as possible like fuck the subtleties of the atreides family relationships um yeah. you know uh uh fuck the the reasons behind the betrayal of dr yeah. ua or even who dr ua is uh yeah, we don't we barely even see him at all yeah, yeah he's like Sorry, he's Oscar like i'm here Isaac, I, by the way <laughs> Oh, yeah, by, by by Duke Leto, you know, you were in this movie for 10 minutes. Um, yeah. And let's just get into the part with the Fremen, which works very well in the second part. Like, you know, in a way of the book overall. Yeah, my, my fear was, Doa, having watched the first one, that the whole damn thing was just going to get rushed. Right. Yeah. But I do think that the trade off that was made in rushing the exposition to get to a very well fleshed out fremen arc was a good choice given the amount of time they had to make these two these two films right right and given what they had to do to get the second film greenlit at all um yeah yeah it's it's a sad but true kind of thing you know yeah so n now we can get into actual dune 2 uh which, which kicks off thanks, thanks for not having a subtitle by the way 
please, I'm, I'm so happy they didn't call it Dune 2 Rise of Paul or something, you know, like, <laughs> that's, that's a plague. The in Revenge Hollywood right of now. the Atreides. <laughs> yeah, Rise of something or Fall of something, like, let's just ban the words Rise and Fall from every, every film title for the rest of time, you know? <laughs> Even Legends of the Fall. Just call it Legends of the. From now on. Sorry, we got to go change that. Yeah. Um, so we we get into we get into this film, and now we have Paul, you know, basically in hiding with the Fremen. The Harkonnens are in charge of Arrakis again. Uh, they're having problems with the the guerrilla war tactics of the Fremen, and we get to what is the kind of the core issue of not only this Dune book, but people who have read Dune, which is like what what Dune struggles with conceptually and thematically at its core is the power of prophecy, um, you know, talking about are these prophets worth following in a way, or is it just another form of control, right? Um, and is, is there... Is there a better way to encourage people? Like, is there a better form of government? Is there a better way to kind of move humanity forward as a as a collective? Um, what is the price that you pay for absolute power, even if you're getting what you want at the at least at the start in the Fremen's case? Um, because this then all of these themes form the undercurrent of the next the books that were. Yeah, basically like the first six books of Dune. Um, sure. And it becomes even more relevant, as you guys know, later on, because it's not just about Paul, but it's about Paul's descendants in later Dune books. Um, and ultimately, uh, that that is the broader narrative that they start to bring up within this book, as you can see by the way that they actually changed Chani's character, who is quite different from the books, to being the one who is very concerned about Paul accepting the fake prophecy that was seeded by the Bene Gesserit um, because she views it as even if the cause is good, the reason why the Fremen people are doing it is a form of outside control. Um, yeah. And that I like that change. Oh, it was a great change, by the way. Like, as somebody who's a fan of the books, this is very much in keeping with the spirit of the. Um, central intellectual ideas of the Dune series. Um, and I think having her undergo the conflict of loving Paul and wanting him to be a leader while also rejecting um, the more like religious charismatic ideas that he ends up using is super fascinating. Yeah, uh, I saw Dune described once, and I, I regret that I don't remember where, but I saw it described once as the anti-Star Wars uh, and and I like that description a lot because it's you you take the sort of hero's journey right and and you take your hero and then what if you end up actually making him like the villain in the end you know what if he instead of like saving you know the the population the world the kingdom whatever you want to have it uh, you know or or learning what if what if he gives into temptation what if he does seize control in a villainous way in the end and uh, and that's you know that's what you get in Dune essentially is you know that it's it's not a happy ending it's not a happy story paul is not a hero because at the end you know spoiler alert you know he he hasn't truly freed the fremen he's just sort of gained for himself an he's army weaponized to use them. for his own ends yeah he's weaponizing this this native population yeah so so uh like not that when when people are like oh yeah go paul wow i'm like you really did you were you were not paying attention were you paul is not there's not really any heroic uh you know there there's no real heroes in this story i mean you could you could kind of argue that chani is is trying to be heroic in the movie anyway is that she's trying to be like hey you know we we don't actually want this we know this is like a fake story but everyone else just kind of believes it because of their you know cultural indoctrination by the bene Gesserit over the generations right so yeah, it's a it's a pretty dark, tragic story when you when you think about it. But I like that it occupies that space as sort of like it was described uh, as the anti Star Wars, um, in that uh, it takes that hero and and turns him to a villain. You know, yeah, so, and it is also like the the kind of terrifying nature of Paul as the Quisatz Haderach, um, because. You know, once they create a prescient being, which they've been 
trying to breed into existence that Bene Gesserit had been trying to breed into existence for generations. It's the questions that become, you know, since he can actually see the future and see all of these possible futures and how to reach them, as a dictator, he becomes omniscient, basically, and fucking terrifying, right? And we also know, because it comes out of his own mouth, is that he is very interested in revenge uh, as his primary driver. And in fact, he is warned by people close to, close to him saying that his father, Leto, did not believe in revenge, and he just straight up says, I do, and like, I'm going yeah. after the Harkonnens, and, and fuck the Emperor who betrayed us, and fuck the Harkonnens, and eventually by the end, guys, it's fuck the entire Landsrad, which is the, the group of other houses who don't recognize his authority. So like, yep. he, becomes, he becomes the Emperor, and he is very intentionally now deploying the Fremen at the end of the movie to subjugate the houses and bring them all under his imperial control. Yeah, and it it shows. I mean, it, it was kind of meant to show too, just how like a, a a culture with a charismatic but very corrupt leader can be led astray in a big way. Like right, the Fremen throughout the entire thing is we just want our people to be free and we just want to govern ourselves and to get our planet back. And at the end, they're running onto that ship to go to war, right? <laughs> so it's it's even their their motives have changed because they've been influenced right. by the leader too. So it's and, it's a very and that's... cautionary kind of thing too. And that's that's the really terrifying part of this is because once they control Arrakis, they are basically safe because Paul has a very real threat, which is that I have yeah. nukes and I will nuke all of the spice. Therefore, no one will be able to do space travel anymore. So they can't do anything. He has he has all the other houses in the bind. And if he was legitimately just concerned about the Fremen and their ability to govern themselves on Arrakis, he could basically just sit there forever, guys, and just rule Arrakis, control the spice, become immensely wealthy, fulfill his promise of terraforming Arrakis, which is something that eventually happens in the Dune books, like, spoiler, but, you know, spoiler. that... <laughs> For books I mean, that are, you're... like, 30 years old, yeah. <laughs> um, but he could just do this without gr his greater ambitions of becoming a the emperor of many, many worlds, right? Yeah, yeah. But let's, uh, so I, that's, I feel like we jumped it. we got ahead of ourselves a little bit in talking about the concepts behind the, the book and the movie, but we should talk about, more about the movie itself and, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think what they did really, really well in it. And the, the first thing uh, that comes to mind is, is not actually the sound, which I do want to talk about and it was fantastic, but is that I felt like I was finally, finally, after all this, marvel stuff after much of the star wars stuff that we've been subjected to um i was finally watching a film again i was finally watching a, a good science fiction film where people cared about things like cinematography for instance uh or you know even something as simple as proper blocking or good choreography or good good acting good direction like this is what we could have in science fiction and things like that if we weren't inundated by this flood of like, you know, cheap Marvel garbage. And like, it's it's amazing because I one of the things. So this will make sense in a moment. But uh, as a as a esports commentator, one of the things I always uh, disliked the most is when there would be a conversation online about a certain commentator being good which would give license to everyone to talk about how they didn't like all these other commentators. I'm like, well, that's not really what the, con you know, why can't we have a conversation about why someone is good without putting down others? Um, but yet, I feel that it's impossible in this case to look at Dune and not be like, you know, why don't we get that level of quality out of, uh, out of these Marvel movies and things like that, these stream shows that have these massive budgets you know, why do these need to be churned out so um, fast food like instead of, you know, being really good? You know, why, where, why, you know, why, do, why does it have to be that way? Right. So it was great to finally see a film where every single frame looked great. You know, oh, yeah. I, I enjoyed that. Well, I, I think and, part and of it is that, uh, you know, Villeneuve is simply a much better artist uh, than yeah. most of the other people that they hire. And he does have a, a look to his films, which is that sure, sure. he uses a lot more shadow in films. Like you'll notice that 
a lot of the scenes are quite darkly lit, which makes them appear very dramatic. Um, and I love the lighting in his films, guys. Like you just look at the way he's not afraid to put a lot like his actors in shadows and it makes it it's a very good signature style of his that you see across many of his films. Um, but yeah. it really uh, does well here. And he also has a very great sense of a unified aesthetic. Right. Like, I think what is even in the first Dune movie, which I said wasn't my favorite, one thing that I absolutely cannot fault it for is the vibes are spot on. Like, if you yeah. imagine if you're reading the books and you're imagining Dune, it's like he walked into your imagination. Right. He is so good at visually displaying the world as it as it appears in the books like in your mind that it's astonishing from the costumes to the architecture uh to the weapons to the special effects like the shields on the people look amazing the combat um everything about this film is wonderful yeah the sense from of an aesthetic scale. yeah the, the sense, sense of scale, scale. Is, is being able to show massive things in a way that makes them actually look massive it's a very it's actually very difficult to show something that's supposed to be really big on the screen in relation to the characters and truly get that feeling of scale to to pop, you know, to really work. And he's he's extremely good at at uh, at that. But you, you mentioned the lighting, and I I feel like yes, he does have his style, but I think a lot of it is just good lighting principles that anyone would learn <laughs> in college. And yet we yet when you look at the lighting for a lot of other things, you know, that are out there right now, it's it's just very flat. You know, everything yes. is very overlit, lit. bright. Or, yeah, yeah. But that that uniform brightness causes a uniform flatness, right? If everything's yeah. bright, nothing is bright. It's all just flat. Uh, so you you don't get any of the drama from the, the visual aspect from it. You're not getting a lot of it from the acting. Um, so, you know, why can't we have that? Why can't we have that in other things? Why is it? <laughs> why is it only Dune? Dune comes out. Oh, Dune's so amazing. Why can't we have more things like that? Because. Sure, Denis Villeneuve is, is a is a great director, but he's not the only one out there that understands you know good lighting and scale and things like that. You know, there's there's lots of other directors that could pull that off, but you know, I want to see those directors do Star Wars and Marvel and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, with the success of Dune, maybe people will go for a more heavily planned, um, you know, long term project uh, with yeah. kind of more uh, and, and better artistic design. I think also what I read about this film and why the visual effects are so much better than we've seen in a lot of other movies is that there is a very well crafted and well planned, um, you know, j conjunction of practical effects, which are often underutilized. Right. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the practical effects that are in this are really good and all the costumes like feel very real and like the places that they're in feel very real. Uh, and also the visual effects. And from people that I've been reading who do visual effects professionally, they say that the reason why this looks so good is because this wasn't a film that the attitude was, fuck it, film it, we'll fix it in post. Everything was really specifically planned out in advance and storyboarded meticulously. So they had... It wasn't like they were doing damage control on the back end or trying to overly CG things. It was a very careful thought process about which elements are going to look better if we actually make them versus which elements are going to look better if we put them in versus CG. And that requires just careful planning. You know, the aesthetic, the color palette, all of these things, if you spend enough time actually um, storyboarding it and developing it in advance and building out the costumes and seeing how they look and then expanding that slowly with enough thorough planning, you can actually get to this end stage of Dune where it feels very real, like a real world. Yeah. I don't really watch Marvel films and think like this feels like a real place, but <laughs> Dune feels incredibly real. Right. Well, it, it's surprising how much of the sets were were actually like built out sets. Like, or yeah. I should say, it's surprising how much of what you see was a actual built set versus you know you see one person in front of a field of green boxes. Right. That if you go and watch some of the making of with Dune One, Dune Two, uh, you find that there's not a whole lot of green screen, you know, behind the actors for a lot of the stuff, especially a lot of interior shots. They built most of the interiors, including like ceilings right. and things like that, which is but, which is interesting to see. So I feel helped. like I feel like the pendulum is swinging back, though, which is really nice because we got this with Andor, 
as well. We got like real yeah. sets and like yeah. very extensive real locations. And as a result, and you know, the practical effects and the real sets in Andor made it look a lot better than a lot of the other Star Wars content that we've seen. And it made it feel significantly yeah. more real. So uh, one of the big reasons why physical sets are are very important and physical locations are very important. Um, and this is something that I, I feel like the Wheel of Time show, as much as I despise it for other regions, reasons, did pretty well, is that they did do a lot of great location shooting, a lot of great sets and stuff, is that uh, when there is either, when there is something mm. happening in a place, the more that you can have a physical area for the actors to move around in, there's a, a, a better sense of grounding for the viewer to understand where things are happening in space. And it's it's a subconscious thing where if there's just a bunch of green screens and you're just kind of taking the shots that like make them look epic or whatever and you're doing a lot of that, then it, there's this internal confusion that happens in your brain that makes you, you kind of detach from the scene, detach from what the actors are saying and things like that. Whereas if your brain can construct sort of that mental three-dimensional space where the actors are in, you will be much more uh, in tune with what's being said, with the actors actually acting, than, uh, you know, worried about what in the world is going on, where is anyone standing in relation to each other. There's, I don't know how to describe it better than that, but there is a subconscious thing that happens in your brain um, that makes it, uh, makes the viewing experience better when you're able to place the characters accurately in their surroundings. I mean, it also makes actors act better, Doa. I mean, just yeah, straight I would, up. Yeah, I would imagine. I'm I'm not a, you know, I've, I'm not a, I'm a yeah, we, we've done it a couple of Toyota commercials, but uh, I'm not a very experienced actor. But uh, but yeah, it, it helped to be in the car with you instead of in front of a green screen. We were sitting I mean, on green boxes. <laughs> imagine, imagine just trying to be an actor and wearing a green screen suit, like against a green screen with a bunch of sensors all over you and trying to have a conversation where you're pretending you're in an environment. Like, yeah. I, I, even if you're a great actor, there is going to be a price that you pay and there is a cost to the acting that happens in that environment because it is much harder to suspend your disbelief when you're just like, I'm in a bodysuit with sensors. And, you know, it's we're, ridiculous. We're seeing, some, we're seeing some sort of interesting hybrids uh, kind of pop up where if, you, if you've if you read or you've seen things about, um, excuse me, about the, the, the volume uh, is what they call it, that they use in like the Mandalorian and some of the other Disney Plus stuff to create the backgrounds. Um, it's kind of a hybrid where it's just a very yeah. high definition screen. Yeah, with the Unreal Engine. Bright, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but because it's bright enough, it creates a pretty pretty accurate lighting on the actors. They can look around and see things, you know, that they're supposedly their characters are seeing in the world. Uh, and you know, I don't think that's a sub. If that's a perfect substitution, but it's an interesting. No. It's an interesting workaround that seems to be okay. It seems to have like a fairly positive um response from the actors uh again this is based on me going back and watching some of the making of stuff from some of the disney plus star wars stuff because that's where they kind of the mandalorian is where it first was really used extensively um so that it is interesting that that stuff is kind of happening and it's cool it's really cool technology um but you know nothing nothing's gonna match a, a an actual set yeah or an actual location yeah uh, yeah that's that's where i'm kind of at with this but it it really did make a big difference and um, I, I just have you have to give props to all of the very thoughtful design that went into Dune because it is a huge part of making this world feel true and this world feel real. Um, and it it's great. Like I think that's one of the the ways in which it's most successful. And anybody who's read the Dune books, you look at the Thopters and you're like, holy shit! Like I can't imagine them looking any different than they would look in this movie. And you look at the shields and you think. Wow, that like this is so cool, and I can't believe yeah. like this is exactly how this should look. Like I have no notes; it just looks amazing. <laughs> well, it's, it's neat to do it uh, again. If you look, they they built you know full size thopters basically for the characters to get in and out of and be shot inside and stuff, and and uh, that's that that's pretty neat. I would not have expected that, uh, but then yeah, if you watch the making of there, it's all there. You know, it's it's very very cool. So uh, we... those shields, I mean, you want the shield, the shields always get me because yeah they look good in this movie and then I think about how they looked in the 1984 movie where they basically <laughs> turned them into like Minecraft characters, <laughs> but it's uh, they they look, you go back there they're just covered with these kind of like glassy blocks they they do look like Minecraft characters when they turn the, <laughs> when they turn the shields on in the 84 movie it's 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 pretty funny. Uh, 
So thinking about that versus how this looked, it was like, yeah, it's a, they, they improved it a little bit. They did a pretty good job there. But even like, I love how when like the missiles and things hit the ships, they kind of like drill slowly into the shields and then there's the explosion inside and then the yeah, shield dissipates. Beautiful. And it, it, like just that kind of attention to detail where it's like, okay, where well, if there was combat in this universe, how would these weapons interact with different surfaces and objects and with the shields? And there was a lot of uh, attention paid to that. And it creates this cool, genuine otherworldliness to it where it's yeah. like, okay, I really am seeing like a different level of technology, um, which is which is neat. They they call it the ancient future, which is a cool uh term for that. Because on the one hand, you're you're not using computers, there's a lot of you know, sword fighting and things like that because these shields exist, but at the same time there's still a lot of, you know, you know, new and unique ballistic weapons and laser weapons and things like that. Just seeing the lasers cut through, you know, the big spice miters and stuff. Super cool. Makes me want to have a Mech Warrior movie. Come on, let's let's do it. Oh my I, as somebody who's a massive yeah. battletech nerd, um yeah. yes, please. I, honestly the, the big battle, slow moving. Battle yeah. tech a battle tech movie would actually be pretty fire at this point in time, especially because oh, there's totally. a lot of as somebody who was uh, a hyper battle tech nerd as a teenager, and I read a lot of the novels and I played the original miniature game. There's a lot of there's a lot of world to work with right there with um, the clan invasion and everything like that. And yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it it would work really well, uh, especially hey, if somebody like well, Vill Villeneuve would direct it. That would be amazing. Oh, dude. I, well, here's the thing. I think we might get something, you know, similar in a way in certain parts uh, where if we do get like a good 40K universe, either movie mm. or series, you've got like the Imperial Knights there and the the Titans and things. And those are huge, huge mechanized uh, walking war machines, which are very cool. So um, I, I go back to like whenever I think about this, if I may digress for a moment, I, I go back to like Pacific Rim and how good the oh, mechs yeah. looked in that because yeah, they sure. had them move like they would move in real life for the most part in the first movie. Uh, where they were more slow and plodding, and each movement seemed much more planned out and mechanical, and and yeah, it looked it looked great, and it actually caused a difference between the way the mechs moved and the way the monsters moved. There should be a difference because one's organic, one is, uh, one is not, you know. So uh, that I feel like is a great uh, model for how we can do big mech stuff in the future. So hopefully we get that. Um, and yeah, they can have lasers like we saw in Dune. <laughs> So Which let's let's talk as, about there we go. Yeah. let's let's talk about a little bit of the the plot um of Dune sure. two because this is where for me like I said was the big difference between Dune one where mm -hmm. it was like hurry up let's get all the these plot points passed as fast as possible like we need the we need them to move we need the betrayal to happen okay there's battle and then they meet the Fremen and the movie's over right yeah um, bye Duncan. <laughs> but, but, but by Duncan for now. Uh, well, that Duncan's spoiler. There are other, nope. Spoiler, there are other Duncans oh, later. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's right. The gun the Clone Wars have. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've read that um, much into Dune Messiah, at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, but this this film really does take its time with a, it's very dialogue heavy with a lot of conversations between Paul and Chani and Stilgar and the other mm -hmm. Fremen. There's the a very good development arc for multiple characters, including Jessica, as she becomes a, a reverend mother and kind of gains yeah. gains the powers through the water of life and, you know, her goals and how she's trying to set Paul up to both become the Kwisatz Haderach as well as fulfill the prophecies that were set in motion by the Bene Gesserit so that they can retake Arrakis. Um, and so he can kind of become the most powerful version of Paul Atreides that is possible and mm -hmm. is in line with the Bene Gesserit's thousands of years of planning. They never um, wanted him to exist to begin with though. That that is something we should touch on is that they didn't well, want they didn't want Paul to exist. They wanted their Kuzach Haderach, but they didn't want it they didn't intend for it to be Paul. Jessica was supposed to have a girl and yes. keep the breeding program going. So but what, 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 what was supposed to happen was Jessica was supposed to have a girl who was supposed to um, reproduce with Fade Rotha. Uh, and yeah. that and the child of the Atreides uh, girl plus Fade Rotha was supposed to be the Kwisatz Haderach. But this is not a precise science, Stella. Um, because they didn't know exactly when the Kwisatz Haderach would be coming. And so... Oh, so, no, that's why they are okay. testing Paul. And then later on in this film, you see them test Fade, Fade Rotha as oh, yeah. well yeah. with the Gom Jabbar. And Fade Rotha also starts to have 
uh, premonitions of the future within this movie. So there, this latent ability is developing further, but they didn't know exactly when the Kwisatz Haderach was arrived, so they just kept the breeding program going until the Kwisatz Haderach uh, emerged. So they were mad um, that Jessica didn't do the thing that she was supposed to do, but also there was still the possibility that in this generation, the the, the powers that they had been breeding for would be enough to produce the Kwisatz Haderach, which it does, right? So. Yeah. But then that thing that they were intending to be birthed and then raised under their control essentially became totally out of control, which is a pretty big problem for the universe. Well, we'll so out. so yes and no. I mean, the, basically, you know, the, the narrative that the Bene Gesserit give in this film is that Irulan is either going to marry Paul or fade Rafa, depending on who kind of triumphs in this scenario. Sure. But either way, like the old emperor is on the way out and they're trying to control the new emperor. And so it's kind of yeah. to be determined whether the Bene Gesserit are able to control Paul under this new um, space regime or not. Seems unlikely. But let's let's talk about the old emperor for a moment. <laughs> so I loved I loved all of the casting. Uh, in this movie, I really, really did, except for one person. I and mean, Jason person... Momoa was pretty bad in the first movie, but I, yeah, f sure, but like he was only in it for five minutes, so whatever. Uh, we didn't really get to see what he could do anyway. But, uh, but uh, Aquaman aside, but uh, I, I like, I have liked Christopher Walken as an actor for many, many years. I have liked him in in many, many things, from Sleepy Hollow to uh, the Outlaws uh, TV British TV sh series, which is great. Um, but he was terribly, terribly miscast as the emperor of the universe in this. Like, I mean, just like the guy has one, he has one character and that character is Christopher Walken. And when you see him sitting there and that, you know, he's got the same Christopher Walken hair, he's got the same Christopher Walken face. And he's like, this Paul Atreides send the assassins to kill him. So we can not worry about it anymore. You know, he's like, he doesn't, I'm, I'm like, Christopher, act, just act, be a character. Don't just be yourself, please. But, and I like Christopher Walken a lot, but I did not like him one single bit in this. Every time he talked, it was on the screen. Uh, I, w I was totally taken out of it. Like the very beginning. It when is they jarring. Just showed him, like, I told the emperor, you know, uh, I about this and the emperor said nothing. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Oh, that was weird. That was close. I did not want to hear him talk this this early in the film. I didn't want it ruined this soon. And then when he did talk later, I was like, well, it had to happen at some point. But yeah, that I I mean, I don't think Salvador Dali would have been a great emperor either in a Yodorowsky's Dune way back when. But like, there had to be somebody else. I'm sure there would have been somebody else to to pick. I'm not gonna like guess who, but like. Anybody just, just, like, just shove anybody. Kenneth Branagh in there, man. That shit would have been amazing. Yeah, anybody <laughs> you know, I mean, there were a lot of other choices where you had there were a million any, other choices. Gary Oldman, really great... Gary Oldman would have been great. Oh, Gary Oldman, yeah. Uh, uh, Kenneth, who's, Kenneth Branagh would have been great. Totally, Brian Cox totally great. would have been great. Um, I mean, there, yeah. there's a million people you could put in this role. I agree. Christopher Walken was a yeah. extremely weird choice. Yeah, you you don't need. You, he is like the last role in Dune where you need somebody that stands out uh, for being the human being that they are in real life versus the character in the movie. Uh, and and they did, they put Christopher Walken in there. I don't know. As soon as I heard that casting decision, I was like, oh no, I know exactly what's going to happen here. And it's going to irritate the crap out of me. And it did. It did irritate the crap out of me for the entire, every time he opened his mouth. And like, yeah, Christopher Icon uh, Christopher Walken is an iconic actor, yep. uh, no doubt. With an with an incredible career and and uh, you know an incredible amount of of uh, acting prowess, uh, but that doesn't change my opinion that he was woefully miscast in this. Yeah, and I agree. the pr The primary issue is that it's just very distracting that he's in this movie, whereas yeah. the other casting choices kind of blend in much more seamlessly. Um, Which props to Zendaya, by the way, for for being able to to do that. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, you are. Um, well, because uh, you know, after having her be Mary Jane in the recent Spider Man movies, I was like, oh, is this gonna work out? Like, but she she killed it. Like, uh, she did an extremely good job of again, you know, disappearing into the character. Like, legitimately good actor. Uh, and I was and I was worried about that. 
um because she's real you know she was relatively new uh obviously broke out big in in spider-man did great in that but like this is a big change from mary jane to chani and i thought she did great so yeah. yeah, and Timothy Chalamet was excellent. I think he did a really oh, good yeah. job of portraying uh, Paul's character arc and the changes of his character. And I think, you know, particularly the the really standout actors in this are Javier Bardem and Rebecca Ferguson, who play Stilgar and Lady Jessica. Both of them are immensely good in this movie. And Javier Bardem, without the humor, like he does the subtle humor around the Stilgar role so so well it's it's just absurd yeah. how good he is in this movie um and jessica as well does such a excellent job of her character transformation and being the the plotting uh puppet master um behind the the fremen religion basically and taking on that role and setting th everything up because you still feel the love for paul but also mm -hmm. that is in conflict with her duties as a Bene Gesserit in order to realize the Kwisatz Haderach, where she has to put him potentially in life-threatening danger multiple times uh, while still being his mother. So like the, she builds an amazing tension, I think, in that role. But Javier Bardem, yeah. man, holy moly, is still gar. What he did, I think the, the best thing uh, about, what his about his performance was that in those moments of humor, because if you think about it, like, it's humorous, but it's it's really not funny, actually, because you're seeing this person just be kind of totally taken by the zealotry. And so what you're seeing is is very scary on a human level, you know, uh, whereas it does add these little moments of levity. And so the way he played that, I think, where he didn't go too extreme, he didn't go ham and, and go full comedic, uh, he went to a level that seemed, uh, you know, that added that levity, levity but also, you know, added... Uh, a subtle fanaticism, fanaticism, right? To the point where, like, you know, the the internet is like is missing it a lot. Where it's like, this is sad that this is happening to this character. We're supposed to feel sympathetic for him in these moments, you know. Uh, we're not supposed to be like, oh man, Stilgar is great. What a, he's Paul's biggest cheerleader and all that. I'm like, yeah, but he's, you know, if you really think about what's happening, it's 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 a uh, not super happy. Um, but he he rode that line so well that you can kind of like get both things out well, of it as a viewer and, and uh, I, think, I think i think that was great i think it's actually more effective with the humor doa because in delivering it in a sort of humorous fashion you realize the absurdity of well, that's what my point is that he didn't yeah. go too far with it yeah no you he but you re it right helps amount. you yeah it helps you highlight the absurdity of the things that he's saying such as oh well he's claiming not to be the lisan al Gaib. Oh, he's so humble. Therefore, he is yeah. the Lisan Al guy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and the refrain of "Oh, it's the prophecy coming true" every single time, even though this has been directly engineered yes. for an an outsider to control their society, because it, it, the prophecy itself says that it's going to be a boy and his mother coming in from off world in order to lead them, and explicitly. Now the Fremen and their entire culture have basically just been weaponized for a conflict that has nothing to do with them, nothing yeah. to do with them yeah. at all. Right now, they're part of the grand designs of a, a feudal space house and a noble lineage who is trying to usurp the imperial throne. And how does like qu real question, how does this benefit the Fremen whatsoever? Because they just end up it becoming pawns <laughs> yeah. in a very complex political game. And it was so, set up centuries before. And because of their belief in in this prophecy that was falsely created, now they're all sucked into this. And so I think by having Javier Bardem and Stilgar engage in this through these humorous waves, through his like repeated conviction, oh, the prophecy's coming through, and that everything he does or doesn't do also proves that he is the prophet because Stilgar desperately wants to make him that thing. Um is he wants great. To believe. Yeah. Yeah. He, so, wa he wants to believe and his desire to believe is overtaking his rational is possible rational actions or justifiable skepticism about a random kid from an, a, a, a foreign world's nobility coming in and basically becoming the heart of their culture. Yeah. And so the, the subtlety that Javier Bardem 
delivers that, I think, is what really makes it work, right? Because I could see other actors, again, you know, going too ham with it, jumping up and dancing around and be like, oh, he's a Lisa and I'll give and all that. Um, but, you know, the way he the way he does it is done with much more realism, right? Where you'd be like whispering it to your friends or, you know, you would be you know, in a social setting if someone could testing him. Then you'd stand up and speak against, you know, people. But, you know, it's it's all done in, with such a realistic um, sort of like a, a, a realistic growth of emotion throughout the movie with it to the end where, yeah, he's like leading the charge onto the spaceship to go fight the other houses, like pure fanatic by that point. Right. Uh, that, you know, the, seeing the, the journey of that character, the movie and the way that Javier Bardem portrayed that, I, I think was very impressive because it wasn't one note. It wasn't the same level throughout the movie. It was subtle and growing, uh, and building, throughout the you know transformation of Paul and the sort of like fulfillment of this Bene Gesserit prophecy, right? Uh so yeah, his his performance was fantastic. It definitely it definitely stood out for sure. Yeah, and I think even though the Fremen become tools of House Atreides, there is also a reason that this is happening, and it is because of the persecution of the Harkonnens, both for the century that preceded um the Atreides rule of Arrakis or eighty yeah. years or whatever it was. I don't it was some something around. It was a while. Or, yeah, it was it was, it was uh, multiple generations, um, and now with the return of the Harkonnens to the power of the fiefdom of Arrakis, now they are the ones who are trying to actively stamp out the Fremen once and for all, so that they don't have this thorn in their side. And so it is, you know, in in a way, right? That's what activates the prophecy too, and people's willingness to believe is the threat of an external force, because they have to have something to rally around. And here comes Paul, this charismatic leader with their religion backing him up. And mm -hmm. yes, he is good in the short term in terms of ridding them of the Harkonnens, but it's the long-term implications of this that become much more sinister by the end of the film. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, it you you really see, uh, you know, a, a mom who just really loves her child too, you know, and, and puts him first. <laughs> and really loves power, and, uh, let's be honest, and really loves... Yeah, really... Loves power and and loves uh, you know setting your son up with a nice with a nice you know wife uh, if it's a, I guess it's a princess I suppose but you know it's a you know a lot of really uh, boss mom stuff is that the term we we use I don't know but anyway <laughs> Lady Jessica what uh, get her a nice what a card boss for Mother's mom. Day. <laughs> get her a nice card for Mother's Day Paul because she helped deliver you the universe well, <laughs> so, well what literally. I what I. <laughs> what I loved about this, too, is that we talked about how Paul's motivations are maybe he's doing things potentially for the wrong reasons for revenge. Right. But Jessica is also doing things for the wrong reasons, because when she's telepathically communicating with the emperor's, you know, truth sayer, who was her teacher by the end of the film, because remember that her teacher who gave Paul in the first film the uh the test with the gom jabbar hand in the box uh, is, thing in case you don't yeah. remember what gom jabbar means oh yeah. yes the hand in the box of the poison yep. needle that the gom jabbar is the the poison needle yes um who is giving him that test and who is kind of the chief architect of the bene Gesserit's plans because she's the advisor to the emperor and she ends up on arrakis with princess irulan and with the the padishah emperor um, you know, the, the telepathic conversation that they're having is that Jessica is literally telling her that she chose, ha ha, you chose the wrong side. And she's saying, no, Jessica, there are no sides, right? This is, this is part of a grand design to, we are working together to achieve this one thing, which is the creation of the Kwisatz Haderach. Um, and this isn't a, a side issue. Right. But Jessica is almost doing this in a way to prove that her decision to have Paul instead of a girl was the correct one. Right. There's an insecurity to, there. Yeah. Well, it goes back to too where where, you know, Jessica was was supposed to procreate with Duke uh, Leto Atreides, but she she ended up falling in love with him, which she was not supposed to do. And so she is also driven by revenge because of the murder of her husband and all that. And so feels doubly sure about setting her son up for success because of the you know tragedy that's happened to her family but uh, you know as we saw with fade rotha the bene Gesserit sometimes just show up and uh you know get get the baby stuff from you and then peace out you know and that's just their job right so well Jessica who would to be fair to do that too it seemed like right 
who who is going to have fun hanging out with Fade Rotha? Let's <laughs> like let's be real, Doa. The, the the Leto experience is much people. more pleasant, uh, you know, yeah, than the the Fade yeah. Rotha psychopathic murder experience. That's true. Yeah, cool outdoor environment, a bit bleak, but uh, I wouldn't want to. I don't think we're going to see any like uh, you know happy go lucky sitcoms around the uh, the um, Harkonnen family anytime soon. <laughs> That's my Rautha. <laughs> I I love that though, and I think we should talk about the the Harkonnen d- dynamics because that was one of the best yeah. parts of this film. Oh, was... hanging with Baron Harkonnen. <laughs> that makes that perfect, right? That's perfect. <laughs> I like Hanging I love balloons, you know. Yep. I loved Stellan Skarsgård in this. He was, oh, he was so, so good. He's um, becoming one of my favorite actors. Oh, he's uh, great. He's, obviously, he's been an actor and he's been in a lot of stuff for a long time. He's it's not like he's a new actor or something like that, but he's he's so good. Yeah. Yeah, he he was great. Um Dave Bautista playing a very different role than in Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, yeah. was awesome as Raban, uh kind of the very angry, violent, uh incompetent uh you know leader of Arrakis the right hand of of Baron Harkonnen and then they introduce Fade Rotha here who is the kind of more savvy cunning and intelligent version of Raban but also more psychotic um he loves his pain <laughs> like they, uh, they imply that he he kind of enjoyed the Gamjabar experience <laughs> so it's like well you know but it it's it was in, he was we didn't get a lot of screen time with him and it was just the nature of the beast that that character couldn't be, you know, in there as much as it probably should have been in like a mini series. Like we talked about earlier, cause there's a lot more to that character. Uh, but yet I think they did a good job of establishing his personality as somebody who is absolutely just murder oh, crazy, yes. but at the same time has his own sort of internal code of honor and respects other people that show strength as well. So there, there was a. I felt like there was a decent amount of depth given to his character, despite the small amount of time allotted to it. Uh, I was impressed by how much they were able to flesh him out with as little as as we got. You know. Yeah, and Austin Butler also did a great job with the role. I mean, oh, yeah, he was sure. he was really wonderfully acted. Um, and I I also enjoyed the fact that they used Fade Rotha to show. Harkonnen society and like the the principles that they value because Fade Rotha is obviously beloved by the people um yeah. that you see when he's fighting in that epic arena in the gladiatorial match and you know Baron Harkonnen uses him to be kind of tricky and like not drug the the one of the the captured member fighters from House of Treaties um, was that supposed to be Doctor? Uh, what's his face? By the way, no, they killed I him. I couldn't, okay. Oh, they killed him. They killed him. All right, never mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't remember because I couldn't. We only saw that character for like ten minutes in the first movie, so I was, I was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so but I mean, they they didn't drug one of the prisoners, and then it becomes like, oh, I did that for your benefit, nephew. I had to see like the real metal, and you get to see all of mm-hmm. the the machinations within the house of Harkonnens to basically produce the most, you know, savvy, cunning, uh, ruthless political animals that they can so that they can perpetuate the dominance of their house. And it's very yeah. different with the, the Atreides relationships that are built around honor and training. Also, you know, paranoia, like the Atreides are extremely paranoid for justifiable reasons, it turns out, because when you have enemies for centuries like the Harkonnens, you kind of have to be on your on the on your toes at all times looking for the assassination attempts and the traps and everything. But you really get to see the stark differences between uh, Harkonnen and Atreides and the values within these families uh, because you get to into the internal life of both houses of nobility and i think that's very cool yeah for sure it's uh it it is to i really hope we do get more of this but i don't know if i want it in film form the funny thing is that said dune messiah is like short enough that you could make a film out of it it's a really short book um so uh I guess you could do that as one film, then jump into the mini series. I don't know. Maybe we'll maybe we'll get a third one now. I feel like we are going to get a third one at this point. The response to this has been All so right. good. Well, here, here's but... the thing, Doa. As you get into Children of Dune and God Emperor of I, Dune, I have heard. I have heard. I, I am skeptical that 
they are capable of being filmed. Okay, guys, I, it gets so metaphysical heard. at a certain point in time that <laughs> I wonder if it's going to be a possibility. Um, I think uh, here's here's my prediction. I think we get to Dune Messiah where everyone sees Paul is actually like not someone to root for, and then everyone's gonna like be like, "Oh, never mind." You know, <laughs> well, they should have kind of gotten that impression already, but there's a lot of go Paul people out there. And I'm like, well. <laughs> He's kind of bringing intergalactic war, uh, you know, where there wasn't one before. And, you know, could have just stopped at Freeing Dune, but eh, <laughs> all right. Go Paul. Well, regardless, though, we are going okay. to have, um, you know, Dune Prophecy as a TV show upcoming true. on true. Max, um, which is going to be a prequel to the Dune movies. So I am curious yeah. where they're where they're going to go with some of this material. It is set yeah. 10 10,000 years before Dune. Oh. Well, when did the when did the war with the AI happen in this in this universe? When did the Balerian Jihad happen? I don't yeah. remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah. It was a well, long time in the past, but I don't know exactly. They definitely don't say jihad in this in these movies. That's for sure. But there were some <laughs> elements of the book that were, you know, probably hit going to hit a little bit too close to home uh, if they had kept them, such as you know the the holy war only being referred to as jihad in the books. And then well, it was, uh, it was a, believe... the Butlerian jihad was the war against the AIs. Let's be clear. Right, so it wasn't. Yeah, he also uses the word jihad to describe the, the Fremen. Uh, doing their thing too i believe the word is used a lot in the book but then uh, and i know some of the fremen language in the book was if i recall correctly like actual arabic words that uh that were used occasionally as well as some made up stuff and they removed all of the real words and created a fully artificial language for the fremens in the movie which was probably a, a good idea yeah yeah but um yeah any any other final thoughts on dune to doa i mean i think it's uh, it's something that everybody should see in the theaters obviously totally. i mean you want to yeah. probably talk about the sound design or the music a little bit because that was also yeah. just immensely alien which really really worked uh really worked well they did a lot of uh they did a, there's a whole bunch of making of stuff out there that everyone who enjoyed this movie should definitely go and watch because the sound design was something they really put a lot of extra effort into yes. as well going out and they like invented instruments for this they did that, yeah, for sure, for some of the soundtrack. Uh, they did a lot of recording out in the desert. They stuck microphones into the sand and, like, hit the sand next to it to, like, try to find out what it really sounded like to hear things resonating through sand and all that. And, and yeah, every every single thing you see and hear in this movie is just really impressive. Um, but, yeah, the, the music was great. It was, you know, big when it needed to be. It was uh, subtle when it needed to be. Uh, the But the the... The sounds too, like the sounds of the thopters, the sounds of the the sandworms, the sound of everything was just, yeah, r really, really good. And you know, you didn't hear a lot of the same sound effects you sound you hear all the time, which is nice. What there were no yeah, Wilhelm you, screams, yeah, or, or squeaky doors, <laughs> squeaky metal doors, you know, that one, yeah. No, uh, no yeah, Wilhelm ha screams this time, yeah. Hans Zimmer actually uh, already won an Academy Award for the soundtrack to the first Dune movie. So it's already been recognized, you know, what he's done. But I think yeah. just the immense kind of and very bizarre alien sounding like swelling musics when the epic scenes take place makes the film feel very otherworldly. Um, and it it is unlike any other soundtrack for any other film that I've heard. And a lot of that is because they they really went to the nth degree in terms of researching this, inventing instruments, making it sound very weird. I remember something that we we didn't talk about that we have to talk about because it's a major, major change from the book <laughs> is Paul's little sister. Come oh. on. Like we didn't even talk about her at all. Like in this movie, she never is she's not born. Yeah, she, she is born in the book. Yeah, in the in the womb, but in the in the book she's born, and she yeah. gets to be about. There's a time skip in the book, actually, and so she gets to be about three or four years old. And yeah, in the book, basically, the he, I understand why they didn't do this because if they did I, it yeah, the way I, it was I'm in the book, you would you would have to have a multi year period where he was with the Fremen before the the end of the film, whereas they accelerated that, which for the purposes of the yeah. movie makes it much more coherent, where it's not just like. Three years later, you know, and they they do they do show her uh, with Anna Taylor Joy's cameo. Um, so little little nod <laughs> to a future Doom movie, possibly. But um, but uh, 
in yeah in the in the book it does get weird because she's like three or four years old but because of the stuff with the uh the um water of life yeah the uh warm blood that her mom drinks she's affected in the womb becomes like basically a super psychic as well and so she's like three or four years old but talking like a an aged uh, adult and she's the one who ends up killing baron harkonnen in the book so it, it's there would be a lot of weird stuff that would have taken too much time to set up to make it not be totally like laughable uh so i like that they just bypassed the entire thing where yeah, they, they and, had her speaking with her mom but they left it at that i think that yeah was a good and, and there is her it's not going to affect her future character arc either no, no not going to affect what happens in the particularly in the next book um yeah uh because there will be a time skip in that case but it will make sense because it's kind of between movies and we can advance the plot or start the plot at a later point when she's older right and to explain right. why if you guys are curious that happens to her and why she's kind of this adult in a child's body. It also has to do with the fact that, um, you know, in the in the movie, you see the old Reverend Mother kind of freak out because they realize that they've given the water of life to her while she is pregnant. And mm -hmm. the thing is, is that trial that the Bene Gesserit undergo to become Reverend Mothers, it kills men. But what it does is it unlocks what's called genetic memory within the person who takes it. So once they get advanced enough, they explain this in the film, the Bene Gesserit can transmute the poison in their body into a benign substance so they don't die. Um, but in this process, it unlocks the genetic memory. So basically, they have memories of every single of their female ancestors through the, their entire lineage. So they become immensely wise. They can start, you know, understanding different lifetimes of their previous ancestors. And so it, it's an immense gift of knowledge uh, and burden of knowledge that they receive. But uh, there is a risk uh, if you undergo this when you're not ready of becoming what they, they what they call an abomination, which is that if you are not prepared, you can actually be overtaken by your your ancestors um so they don't do it to children because if you're not kind of mentally strong enough effectively past lives that you're remembering can like overtake your body where you become like basically possessed uh by a different person who was one of your ancestors and mm -hmm. spoiler that that becomes a problem later on and is justified why this should not have happened um yes. And the the Kwisatz Haderach, what they're actually trying to do by giving Paul the water of life is that one of the powers of the Kwisatz Haderach is not only prophecy um, and the ability to see the future, but a man who can see both his female and male ancestors' memories. So he actually has genetic uh, memory from both sides of his line as opposed to just the one uh, that Jessica has or other reverend mothers have. Yeah, so so it's uh, pretty dangerous uh, to do if you're you're not ready. So anyway, that's a uh, so with his little sister, I I uh, just I'll say again, I I'm glad they changed it because it would have been way too like yes. slammed in there if they they wouldn't have. So that's that's the last thing I have to add to this uh, conversation. I think yeah, I think that's that's gonna, yeah. And I think I think Villeneuve in interviews has been very careful to say that. This is an adaptation of the work. It's not going yeah. to be 100% faithful. I think most of the changes he made, particularly to Chani's character, make a lot of sense in the greater scope of the, the themes that underscore Dune. And even though I am personally sad that they didn't do as much world building around what the Spice is supposed to do, the Mentats, uh, the Spacing Guild... Uh, all of these other aspects of the world, I understand that it would have been very burdensome, potentially, on new people. And for those of us who know the world and know the books, it is all visually represented there. He doesn't leave it out visually. You see Thufir. Thufir is a character. Um, yeah. But... The you know the he can't he basically I think had a choice between doing the Mentat storylines or the Bene Gesserit and if I had to pick I would have picked the Bene Gesserit oh, well, storylines as well right obviously the Bene Gesserit is much more applicable and, and important <laughs> for this particular story arc for sure yeah yeah and and also just I think Mentats are very interesting but Bene Gesserit are just more interesting um, oh yeah. yeah and so I think like by showing the Bene Gesserit by dedicating the the time to more Bene Gesserit stuff it does serve the film and the themes better in the end um and i think it this is this is overall a very successful adaptation as somebody who really enjoys the the source material 
it reminds me of Lord of the Rings uh, when Peter Jackson did those films um, in, mm. in the same vein where when uh, I read the books, I was like, OK, I see why this was changed or taken out. And for the for adapting it to film, that was a good decision, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think where you yeah. where you want to be when you do these adaptations is you just know you're never going to get everything that's in the books in there. And mm -hmm. so what you want what what I want to have happen when I watch this is as somebody who knows the source material, I want it to be represented in a way or like my knowledge fills out the complete world while it can stand alone in the films. And if people want to know more or want to enjoy the universe more, then you can go and read the books, right? But Lord yeah. of the Rings is an excellent example of a film series that holds up really, really well on its own. And you can always go back and read Tolkien, but it is faithful to the spirit of the works. And I feel that that is very much true of these, these Dune films as well. Even if I was much more skeptical when I saw the first one about where this was going, I think the second one was handled so well that it justifies a lot of the decisions that were made um, to accelerate or cut things out of, of Dune part one. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, I, I feel that we have gotten very fortunate to get these movies at all. Um, again, just because of the state of Hollywood right now, because of the, uh, you know, the history that Dune has in cinema like I think the stars aligned very nicely for us to get such a, a great adaptation of of this book, and so it'd be nice if it happened more. But I, I think we got lucky with this one. I think it's I, I think it's great. I'm still gonna lament the fact, Doa, that this could have been HBO's new Game of Thrones, you know? Yeah, and sure, like been, this could have been a multi-year miniseries. It's like this is I I agree I agree from a storytelling perspective 100, percent but. I'm very happy I was able to see these movies on a giant screen and with that giant sound system. And, and you know, since people who are listening to this right now are are probably not in a movie theater, um, unless we start broadcasting this in theaters, <laughs> which, why would we ever do that? But maybe we should. But, uh, you know, so so for those of you out there, like, go see this movie in the theater. Um, for sure. And then get, get upset the same way I do when they try to t tell you to go to theaters while you're in the theater, but uh, I, I digress. <laughs> Definitely a movie to go see in the theater. You've still got time uh, when the, whenever this episode comes out. I'm sure it's still going to be out there. So if you haven't seen it and you've listened to this whole episode for some reason, then uh, go see it. All right. Because <laughs> it's great. I, I really liked it. Yeah. And as a reminder, guys, we will be doing the Denis Villeneuve arc on foreplay. So uh, Arrival is the first film that we're doing there. And I'm sure great. you and I, I, I watched Arrival again last night. It is fucking great. Really, yeah. really good movie. It's another sci-fi movie that is just excellently done by Villeneuve. Um, so uh, hit up our show there. Remember to subscribe to this channel. And next week, we'll be coming back with the first four episodes of Shogun. I know on the last episode, we we were, said we were going to talk about Constellation. I've seen the first four episodes. Constellation is excellent, guys. We are going to wait until the whole series is done on Constellation, and we will return to that. But we've got a lot coming up. Three-Body Problem on Netflix, Constellation, Ninja Kamui, and Doa, our favorite, the second Rebel Moon movie is uh, oh, also yes. in the car. Oh, yes. What sci-fi what, what sci franchises have not been aped yet by uh, <laughs> by uh, Zack Schneider? Let's, let's find out. That's right. Well, what we get... Where's the dune section? When when do they go to the desert planet and ride the sandworm? Like that's that's a level of that's a level of rip it rip offedness we see we can expect from Rebel Moon that they will go to a sand wor world and ride some sort of worm through the sand. Be like it's the the sand the the uh, sand snake. You gotta gotta ride the sand snake <laughs> to pick up our our ninth character in a fifteen minute segment. But I think sure the, the real question is, it's... which Kurosawa film will they rip off for Rebel Moon Part 2? Oh, what's the one uh, where the guy has to impersonate the other guy? Is that Yojimbo? Well, he he's that's the Yojimbo is the one where he is playing both sides of the town being as a mercenary. Um, May, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there's one where some guy has to impersonate like a leader that was assassinated or something like that. I can't remember, but maybe that one. Maybe that one. We yes. should we should we should honestly do like a separate video or a separate segment about like predictions for the second half of Rebel Moon about what uh, sci-fi franchises will be ripped off and how they do them. Maybe that should be like a mini video. Uh, Fair enough. You know, comment <laughs> down below to see if you would like to see us predict what sci-fi franchises will be ripped off and how by the second part of Rebel Moon. Very good. <laughs> the Star uh, Giver. <laughs> All right, guys, we will be back uh, next week. 
with, by popular demand, the first four episodes of Shogun. We will see you then.